Welcome to the B2B Thought Leadership Podcast, where it is our job to help you, the listener, to become the go-to thought leader in your niche. Our goal is to get clients to come to you by creating and distributing quality and consistent content. And today, we have Emery Mitchamore, who is a commercial insurance broker with USI. Welcome to the podcast, Emery. Thank you, Alejandro. I'm happy to be here. Emery, when, when you go to an event, when you go to um, any professional activity, what do you think comes to mind when people hear your name? I think when people hear my name, they know I'm a friendly person. I, they know that I'm knowledgeable in the insurance industry. I feel that they, uh, I communicate well and they understand that I'm always looking out for their best interests. Therefore, they can talk and speak with me without any reservations. And at what point in your career did you start to pay attention to the quality of your packaging besides the quality of your skills as a leader? I know you, I've known you for several years. I know that you are always looking for information, reading journals and, and going deep into the nitty gritty of the insurance industry. So I know your product if you think about it yourself as a product your product and your knowledge is good but it's no secret that the packaging also it's important when you're selling a product or a service so if you think about the way you talk the way you walk the way you dress as your packaging at one moment in your career do you start paying attention to that that's a great question i think that i really started to notice some of the visual stimulation that you get from your audience uh, in a sales class in college i learned that uh, you need to dress better than your uh, customer or your prospect uh, it does inherently create a an acceptance of a more knowledgeable person if you're wearing a suit I and mean, we always see politicians and lawyers in suits so that we would assume that an expert in whatever industry would also wear a suit so that became an important visual in my program. Um, being in marketing, you're always worried about exactly how you present yourself. And if I present myself as a nicely wrapped suit package, I tend to get the benefit of the doubt, even if I can't speak to the exact information somebody is looking for, they will give me the benefit of the doubt because of the way I present myself. And was this something that you learn through your family, was there research? Because I know in my experience, I had some basics from my family, right? Like my dad told me how to wear a suit and tie a tie, but I know that I did some research to learn some of the nuances. And in your case, I know you pay attention to those because we've had conversation about those, like the different tie knots and, and just like make yourself look as good as possible without going over the top, of course. Is there any, anything there, like any particular resource, maybe a book? Was there like, what put you down the path of trying to learn more about the specifics of, of how to package yourself in a good way? I'd say, I would say that one of the first sales jobs I had as an insurance professional, I had a mentor who was a district manager um, and very successful. He always made it a point to polish his shoes before he went into a meeting. He said that nobody will ever compliment your polished shoes, but every single person you speak with will notice them. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of stuck with me is the little touches are what people remember you by. So you can present yourself in a nice, neat package, but if you miss the details, people will overlook the entire package. And so in speaking with you before, we had again spoken about the, uh, the tie knots and having the, the kerchief uh, being the appropriate color to match both the uh, ensemble and to re represent yourself as a, as being a uh, professional that is ready for anything to happen. So th thinking about that also, what are some of the steps you've taken to make sure that people in your industry get to know you, like you, and trust you? I make it a point to learn from my peers. I believe that I am highly knowledgeable but every person that I work with in my field has some expertise. And it's always better to be quiet and listen to somebody speak and not to snap judge them just because you may know more about a 
holistic uh, view of something, that doesn't mean that they don't have more knowledge about a very specific topic that they have experience with. So I think that that does two things. One, I learn from it. Two, you receive respect from the party that is speaking. And if you're actively listening and asking engaging questions, then that respect uh, becomes mutual. And that is so important in industry where relationships are super important in insurance because I have to have a relationship with the client, but I also have to have a relationship with the insurance company. And they both have to be happy with my performance or I could fall off on either side of the table. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Emery, if you could go back, let's say you could go back in time and start your career all over again. Are there any steps you take earlier to make sure you become known as a thought leader in your industry? For example, I've learned that I remember we used to go to every networking event out there for a while. Of course, nowadays in times of COVID, things have changed. But at the very beginning, we would go out to every possible event just to meet as many people as possible. And then in my case, I realized, for example, that maybe I, I shouldn't go to all the events because of my ideal the audience was not at every event, so I had to be a little bit more selective with those events. Are there any examples like that or any things you would do differently if you could go back in time and start your career all over again in terms of getting people to know you, trust you, and like you? Uh, you made a great point. We, we did go to every event without hesitation. I tend to be more mindful and, and be more deliberate in the decisions of where to go and how to spend my time. I do believe that I, if I had spent more time engaged in that mindfulness about where to spend my time, I would be better off. I would have a better understanding of my client that I'm reaching and looking for and probably better ways to get to them than I currently do. Or yes, I know a lot of people, but not a lot of people that will help with my business uh, or my, my career path. Um, it's always great to know uh, and have a lot of friends but in the business world you need to be deliberate about the friends that you do have so that you can maximize those relationships and so in reflecting back i think that i would have been more uh, conscious of where i spent my time how would you go about it? that's a that's a good point because it's it's tough to find that balance between being too transactional and, and we've seen people like that at events, for example, right? Like right away, they try to qualify you if, if you're not in their ideal customer persona. They just cut the conversation and go somewhere else and you can feel it. But also there's the other extreme of just talking to everybody and, and making it super social and you don't really get to anything. And in the end, if you're doing it to grow as a thought leader, you're doing it because you want to grow your business. Yes, you want to build meaningful and mindful relationships, but ultimately, cash flow and, and deals, it's the ultimate measure that you have to pay attention to, right? Like you could focus long term and try to think, okay, you never know what's going to happen, but you have to strike a balance. Is there anything that you do to make sure that, because I know you're super mindful, you're a great conversationalist, you're a great friend, super professional. How do you find that balance between cutting every conversation and interaction short when you notice, okay, this might not lead to anything valuable business-wise, but also I don't want to dismiss this human being that I have in front of me. That is a very tricky subject to be able to teeter between being professional and seeking out your best client and being social and just being kind to the humans in the room. I don't know that I'll ever be great at it. I'd love to think that someday I'll be good at it, I hope that I can connect with every person that I do meet. I need to get better at being able to exit a conversation that is not going to be beneficial to me. I don't want to ever not value somebody sharing whatever it is they're sharing with me because we all live on this planet and we all are, should be a large community and treat people as we want to be treated. But there is a balance and it will be one that I will always be challenged by. I understand that transactional business and relationship business are the keys to business success, but being humble and being mindful of the presence of just normal human interactions will also teach you 
skill sets that the business world won't ever be able to 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 either take away from you or or won't really be able to uh mold into your greatest self are there any resources emory in this journey it could be courses it could be maybe workshops books anything that has helped you in this process of not only being a mindful connector somebody that yes i want to grow my business but i'm paying attention to to the person that i have in front of me but also with this packaging of your product as a professional are there any resources that you would recommend that you found valuable i have read a lot of books about various uh skill sets that involve interpersonal relationships i cannot speak to one being groundbreaking i find that you will get valuable nuggets in each one of them and if you take the time to record those you will be able to translate them into actual practice but being mindful and always pursuing information uh excellence and expertise in any significant uh industry or any significant motivation that you have um, you must always continue to grow and learn otherwise you become static and complacent and all those things that that are all detrimental to a successful business career so in summary reading and being just just always being uh, let's see, a, a student of the world is the best advice I'd ever seen um, or ever received because I've had a lot of good mentors at times I've really leaned on you as a mentor because of your experience uh, getting your MBA there's some professional classes that I would love to take but I am don't have the ability to pursue a two or three year obligation at the time but yet you can teach me some of those skill sets through our interpersonal reaction or interactions so If you don't learn from books, learn from people. And if you don't learn from people, learn through observation. There's always an opportunity to, to learn. Are there any processes? Because I remember some, I've learned a lot from you as well. I, re I, I always remember that line that you say, because we were talking about connecting with people and um, you can feel when somebody's just doing it because it's a check. Right, like, hey, I just got to send these many messages or connect with your network. And you can also tell when it's mindful. And I would never forget that that kind of like, it's kind of like a tactic that could be misused, but you taught me and I was like, this is really good if you apply it in a good way, which is when something reminds you of somebody, you just message them in the moment so you don't forget. Hey, Emery, I just saw this golf book that reminded me about when we were talking about learning how to play golf. It reminded me of you, hope everything is well. And that's it, right? Like you don't have to strike like a long conversation. You don't have to make a call. Hey, this happened. It reminded me of you. I hope everything is well. Could you speak about some of those elements that you use? In my case, I have to think of it as a process because I'm more of an introvert, so it might not happen naturally. I know you're more of an extrovert and it might be a little bit more natural, but Could you share some of those other tools, strategies, and tactics that you use to keep not only grow and start relationships, but also maintain them in a meaningful way? Well, thank you for, for me helping you. That makes me feel better. Uh, I'd have to say there's a famous saying that probably has become popular now, but I remember hearing it from my mom as a, as a child is, is that you don't remember what people did or did for you. you they remember how you made them feel. And so relationships are one of the few things in life that we can have a direct influence on. We can't control the weather, we can't control circumstances, but we can how, control how we make other people feel. And if we are deliberate in trying to make people feel good, it will give you that, that memory, it'll trigger that memory with the person that will put you in a good light. And anytime mm -hmm. you can be reviewed or viewed in a, in a positive light, then you have advanced your, your position in, in your, your prospect's mind. And the reason I think that is so important is people are always going to be people. Technology is going to change. Interactions may change. I mean, in COVID, who thought we would be doing everything via mm -hmm. video phone or, or WebEx or Zoom or, 
or Google. Nobody anticipated that, but yet here we are, and this is my third web interaction today, third video web interaction. So if you can make somebody feel good without seeing, touching, or, or even being in their presence, then you have put yourself ahead of everybody who doesn't value that. So the best thing I can think of is when it comes to people, if you want to be mindful, then you must remind them as to how they made you feel and how you hope to make them feel. And if you can do that, then you can create a, a atmosphere of a long relationship, both professional and, and personal. And, you know, really my goal is to have as many relationships that are positive in my life as possible before I get called home. You know, that just, that's my personal goal. I, I'm never going to be a Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, or it's just not going to happen. I'm not this super great inventor and I don't have this capacity of mental skills that is beyond any other human. What I can do though, is I can make sure that anytime you spend with me, I show you how much I appreciate it, how much it matters to me, and hopefully how I can reciprocate that value in some form or fashion. Well, one of my um, recent great memories, talking about that, um, and this is a story maybe for another time, but is the piñata that we did recently. That was so good. Um, we had a, we celebrated a, a friend's birthday, and this was so different, and it reminded me of my time as a kid. So it's proof that you are getting it done, Emery. Now, so it, there's a lot of information here, and, and you've talked a lot about other people and how you're mindful. So it's clear that you are really thinking about the human that you have in front of you. Now let's let's put a mirror in there and think about the human that it's looking at you in that mirror. How do you how do you do, deal with that fear? of self-promotion, right? Because it's difficult to, you've worked, you've put in the work, you're learning, you're reading books, you're learning from other people, you're treating them well. You are a great asset for anybody that knows you. But maybe a lot of people don't know that and more people should know it. So, and people struggle with promoting themselves. So how do you deal with that, the typical fear of promoting yourself? I have found that if you are lucky enough to have good peers around you, that if you help share some of their strengths um, with the, the party that you're speaking with, they will in turn share some of your strengths. So if you are not alone one to one, you can always use the other people around you uh, to reinforce your skill set, your industry knowledge, your ability to fix uh, problems. And if you're just one on one with person, if you don't know what their problems or pain points are, then you're still having a personal conversation. It's not a business conversation until one of you identifies the other person's pain points, and then you leap into discovery or some sort of solution uh, brainstorm. Up until then, you're just two people getting to know each other. And that's all you should focus on. Don't focus too much on self-promotion. Figure out what makes the other human want to engage you. And that will be a successful engagement. If they walk away feeling special or feeling like you heard them, they will remember you. And eventually they will ask what you do, how they can do business with you and how they can help advance your business. So I really feel that you're not really doing self-promotion. You're identifying challenges or pain points in another person's life. And eventually they will ask you, what do you do? What can I do to help you? I want to make you feel like you made me feel. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great way to look at it. Now thinking about that, right? If it's just putting yourself in a position where you can help others and others know how you can help them, I know you're involved in a lot of different organizations. You're involved with the rodeo. You've, you're involved in several different um, lead groups. If you could advise to somebody who's starting it out, because I know that can get overwhelming at times if you're doing too many things at once, then you kind of 
let some ball some of these balls drop and that's not ideal if you were if somebody's starting in the industry right like somebody wants to build their brand as a as a thought leader in their b2b niche what would you say to them in terms of recommendations about getting involved in organizations or not or how many or how to go about being involved in different activities other than their day-to-day -day business i'd say the first place to start is things you're passionate about um, what is it that motivates you outside of your business that provides you both happiness satisfaction uh, any sort of positive feeling i do the rodeo because it sends kids to college i wish i had had a scholarship or a full ride scholarship um, there are plenty of people that are deserving of it it only requires my time to help um, generate a pool of money to help these deserving kids go to school. I volunteer with ESGR, which is for its employment services for Guard and Reserve. It's members of the military who uh, work a side job in the military and have a full-time job in the civilian wor world. And our job is to help make sure that their civilian roles are held uh, for them while they're deployed. I am involved in a couple of other industries, or not industries, but uh, organizations that make me feel good. That when I go there, there's some positive, no matter how bad my day was, if I go to this event, I'll be putting a positive positive explanation, explanation point on the end of my day. And that is what I need to go to bed thinking about, not the deal I lost or the mistake that was made by somebody, either myself or whomever, that cost me something. I can think about what I did outside of that to make somebody else's life better, easier, more fulfilling. And that is what I focus on. So I guess don't pursue everything. We've already kind of identified that I overshot it the first time. Uh, now just do things you're passionate about, be deliberate in them, and to engage those people that have similar passions and maybe they could be the best client that you never knew existed. That's great advice. So in that line of thinking, if we're saying that you have to focus, right? Like there are many opportunities out there. You have to pursue the ones that are in line with your values and your, the way you think about life, because that way it's not going to feel as much as work. Then how do you deal with saying no to the, to those opportunities or those events or those groups that don't align with that, but also without burning a bridge, right? Like I, I imagine you get a lot of invitations, a lot of opportunities, maybe even a lot of leads that might not align with exactly with your values and the people that you think you would serve best. Do you have any processes? Do you have any lines, any tactics, anything that you use to say no in a mindful way? I always make sure to let the person know exactly how much I value them thinking of me and how much I appreciate of them isolating my skill set in their mind as being a good fit for this organization or whatever they're trying to get me into. I will try my best to not say the actual words, no, I cannot do that because that is seems both dismissive and like what you're passionate about isn't important enough to me to acknowledge that. So I, I really just try to find a another person that would be a equal or better fit for the organization. So rather than causing a spot to be left void or empty, I try to find a person that will not only fill it to my capacity, but maybe even exceed beyond what I would be able to do. And again, if you listen to people they will let you know these things subconsciously. They will share them with you. Mm -hmm. I always carry a pin. That's my tip of the day is always have a pin, whether it be a business card of your own or a business card that somebody that you met that evening, write a note, put it in your pocket, remember it later, and then try to connect those two individuals so that now instead of saying no and, and burning a bridge, I said yes and found a better fit and brought more people in to this equation, some even exceeding what I could have done myself. Absolutely. That's, that's a great tip. Then thinking about how to build these meaningful connections, events, conversations, are there any stories, 
quote, you mentioned that quote about people will not remember the, the interaction, but they remember how you made them feel, right? There's a lot of, are there any stories, quotes, anecdotes that you repeatedly use to grow as a thought leader when you go to events or, or any other interaction? There are. I honestly can't pull one from the cupboard right now that I could recall being extremely profound. There are mantras out there that you can write on your mirror in the morning or you can have post-it notes around your computer that will provide that extra level at that moment. Those are great. Those, the reason that quotes are so famous is because they're so spot on. You know, it just is one of those things that if somebody makes such a very astute uh, example of a moment, um, then it becomes a quote, right? it becomes legendary. And all you can do really is find the ones that move you and sometimes in the right situations, apply those or share them as I did the one about, you know, they won't remember what you do. They remember how you made them feel. Uh, if you can incorporate those into your delivery, either through just casual conversation or presentation, you will connect with a good portion of the audience who has that feeling, understands it, has heard it before, or just values the person who said it in the original uh, version. So, I wish I could think of a great one right now. Hopefully I will before the end of the, the discussion today, but there are so many of them out there. The, the Wolf of Wall Street, the book that I had gotten from you has a lot of them in it that sell me your, this pin philosophy, which you know, on surface looks ridiculous, but it will allow you to deep dive into a person's framing of how they present stuff or how they receive information or how they share things that they know. It's that, it's a it's an ever going quest. Yeah, that's had so many ways to go from that. That's great. Um, so one, I have several questions about that. So one, because I want to go deeper into the Wolf of Wall Street, for example, because I think a lot of people dismiss him because of what he did, and they think, oh, he's bad. Don't read anything about him because it his trash right and and then there's a lot of value there that people might miss but let's wait a little bit on that i want to go do you have a process for how do you keep track of maybe those quotes anecdotes or stories you want to share because for example lincoln was famously known for always having a story for something right like every situation and people love him because he always have a story for the troops or a story to tell with the politicians and that's how he became so known and, and was able to use his influence with people. Do you have a, and now you mentioned your quote, I know it's difficult to on the fly just bring one because they usually pop when, when something reminds you of them, but do you have any process to, I guess, increase the likelihood of that happening? Oh, I wish I could say I had a, a, a skeleton key to apply here. I don't know that I have a process. I do keep a, I wouldn't call it a journal as much as I would a, um, I guess the, the best sorts of like this podcast, it's a mindful expression of that moment, which is something I learned, something I felt, something I discovered. It's a way of exploring it a little bit on paper. Um, quotes and stuff a lot of times will stimulate that. However, again, right now, it, all I can think of is the quotation marks, <laughs> mm -hmm. which uh, is already, you know, one of those you get boxed out on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah going back to the Wolf of Wall Street, and I probably am I'm, I'm chopping this. I think it's on his, I remember which interview I listened of him, but there's a great story, and, and I think there's a lot to learn from him and his methods. Of course, you can, if you read the book, you see that he can be a little bit pushy. He's kind of like that sales guy that's a little bit stronger on the push. That's okay, there's different styles, but there's a great story about him. Cause you know, when they were making the movie, I think he was in jail or coming out of jail and Leonardo DiCaprio would um, do interviews with him to work on the character, right? And um, just, just to highlight how important it is to know this, everything we're talking about how to build a brand because he 
when he came out, I think he came out of prison and that day they met and he was living, I think, in a tiny apartment with his family and something like that. And, um, and they interviewed him for some things, right? And then one year later, they, had, they were finishing the movie and they did another interview. And when they came, he was in a mansion. And they couldn't understand, like, how is it that in a year you were able to do this if you lost everything, fines, jail? And, um, and he said, well, the skill set, I still have it, right? I, I know how to do it. And nobody's going to take that away from me. So in a year, he was able to go probably not the same level billionaire, but at least wealthy and doing well. And, and they changed the movie to reflect that at the end. So um, just a, a good point on on. Even the people that you think are bad, I think it's important to be to be mindful to listen to them. So I know you're super open-minded. Like we have conversations about this all the time. Is there? I guess how do you deal with when you are in a situation where maybe somebody's not as open-minded, but you still want to be open to building a relationship with them? Or how do you deal with being careful not maybe? bringing up topics that might be might put somebody in an uncomfortable position i mean there in sales there's that common term called mirroring you essentially mirror your prospect or your client or or somebody that you're trying to work with it can be challenging but it is a necessary step into getting to know people um, if you were put off by the first thing that you disagreed with somebody on then you more than likely you're going to have a very limited number of friends and associates because we as humans are all have the ability to think our own to think for our, ourselves so we're not going to be a hundred percent on everything with everyone mm -hmm. so understanding that the mirroring effect which means that you stand sit speak uh, like your prospect is it allows them to drop their guard and maybe that position seemed so fortified earlier has now become a gentle rolling hill and not the fortress you first thought it was. And you can convince them that taking that hard stance on something is maybe not the most appropriate uh, feeling. You know, it just persuading people is a subtlety. You can't mm -hmm. attack anybody's beliefs. And if you, listen, pay attention and mirror them. Maybe you can figure out that they don't really believe that. They just think that that's what everybody wants to hear or, or that, that you are part of some, you know, organization or group of people that they must feel that way to be accepted by. It, uh, it really depends on how well you listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why we have two ears and only one mouth, right? to do double the listening. Now, you mentioned persuading people and mirroring, and, and of course, that could be good or bad, depending. I say that there's a dark, light, dark side and the light side of the force, right, when it comes to persuasion. And a lot of that starts with that first impression. And there's many ways to do it, but usually what happens at events and at professional situations is that you get asked, what do you do? So when you, when Emery gets asked, what do you do? What's your typical answer? I typically say I'm a problem solver. That's the most generic answer I can that won't put people, uh, that won't dismiss me. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'll be honest, as an insurance professional, a lot of people think that we're dry, boring, and that everything we sell them is, is basically useless, except for the one time in their whole life that they need it. And therefore, mm -hmm. we're some kind of scam or uh, we're just you know, out there to get their money. So as a problem solver, people will either inquire more or they'll just accept the fact that I am not committal to announcing my profession, which I remember when we were first starting out, uh, a lot of times people would ask you how old you are or how, how much experience you had. And you were always very articulate is to kind of what is that that uh, uh fencing move when you you move out of the way and you kind of dodge the the call or dodge the question parry right like so you'd parry out of the way and then you would just let them assume what they're going to assume and 
if they needed information, you'd provide it, but you never gave them a quantifiable number or, or industry thing to be dismissed by. And I always saw that that as being a huge advantage because you are a lot of times the expert in the room when it comes to running businesses, understanding businesses, uh, being able to speak to how they should be run rather than how a lot of them actually are being run. But you, you gave everybody the opportunity to kind of share and rather than just tell them what they're doing wrong, <laughs> which I always thought was really valuable because when you're standing next to a really smart person and they don't try to blow everybody away with how smart they are, it you kind of warms you a little bit to them. You know that they uh, value people's pride and don't want to squash it, and, but yet they are not going to you know, be dismissive just because um, they are more intellectual or more book uh, smart than, than the person that is speaking. So I don't know if that really answers the question, but it was always impressive to me to see that. It does. And it does. And there's so many, so many points I want to touch there. So number one, I, I, I remember that. And yes, like that's one of the questions that I hate because it shows, I mean, it's a good question in a way because, you know, they're interested in you. Something caught their attention, but now they're trying to put you in a, in a box, right? When somebody asks, how old are you? It's usually to put you in a box and to see like, should I pay attention to you or how valuable is this, right? Because the typical question is, um, I think Amy Cuddy talks about it, that there's two things that people, the two questions that people want to assess that kind of like the reptilian brain is, can you help me or hurt me? And can you actually carry through with your intention, right? Because like maybe you have a baby in front of you and the baby is mad at you and wants to hurt you, but you need to worry because they can't do anything about it, right? But if a dog is in front of you and they want to hurt you, you might need to do something about it. So um, yeah, I would, that question to me was always like, it also gives you no information at all, right? Like if you get that question answered, what does that say if they're young or, or older? That doesn't tell you anything. Maybe there's somebody older who just made a career switch and they're not an expert in whatever they're doing. They might be an expert in other things. So that that just doesn't give you a lot of information. But uh, but to that point, I practice a lot on what to say because I would get upset and then I wouldn't answer it. And then like I came up with like kind of like scripts that I could use to get out of the way without like making it seem that that was the intention. But to your point, you, you mentioned also something great that it was that you've noticed that when you say you're in insurance, people kind of dismiss you because of the reasons you mentioned. So you've gone away from answering directly that question to saying that you're a problem solver. So could you talk to us a little bit about how that happened, right? Like, was this a process that, hey, you realize this is getting me nowhere, I need to change it? Did you try many different things? How did you arrive at saying I'm a problem solver when you get asked, what do you do? I really came about because uh, you're right. There is a, a a sort of a cloud hanging over the insurance term or insurance agent. They tend to think of the flow, the girl on TV, or uh, Jake from State Farm, which there are some similar characteristics that we have and similar job uh, skills that we have in common. However, the reason I went to problem solver is because insurance is the protection that you have against business problems. Um, people don't necessarily relate the two together. They think of only catastrophic events from, from the weather or something along that nature as being all insurance related, but that's not the case. And I didn't want to end up being reviewed or being seen as a walking, talking flow. It just didn't have the, imagery that I wanted. It didn't have the industry expertise that I have. It didn't share with people how much I was concerned with their problems and, and addressing their problems. Uh, being in insurance is really is all about relationships. If you, mm -hmm. I, one of the things I tell people all the time, people laugh at me or whatever. And I saw that there's, there's five people that you got to tell the truth to your mom, your God, your doctor, your attorney, and your insurance person. We can help you in every situation throughout your whole life. Mom's always going to love you. Your God is always going to teach you lessons, both positive and negative throughout your life. 
your doctor is going to save your life. Your attorney is going to keep you straight and narrow and the insurance is going to keep your ass out of a sling. If something goes wrong, mm -hmm. we're the ones that are going to rebuild your house. We are going to rebuild your business. We are going to cover one of your valued employees that was injured because of negligence of another employee. You love both the people. You cannot, in your capacity, hate either one. But if it wasn't for insurance, you'd have to do something deliberate about both those people. But if we're involved, we take care of everything. We cut the checks. We make sure that everybody gets to the doctor, make sure that wages get covered while the injury is being experienced. And then after the fact, so in sharing the truth with us, you will get a more honorable relationship with your insurance professional. And ultimately that means we're going to know more about each other than a lot of other people would ever care to share with another human. I've seen and heard a lot in my 13 years in insurance. Um, I mean, I've had people call me in the middle of the night that something terrible happened or their house is on fire and mm -hmm being able to walk them through that experience because I've seen it before and I know how to get through it. Uh, you're providing solutions to a problem that a lot of times they didn't place upon themselves. Somebody else did, but they're ones that they're having to live through. And if I'm the guy that they choose to walk through it with them, then I feel like that level of respect is, you know, something that not a lot of us get to, to feel in life where somebody appreciates, everything that you're doing and you're doing it for them with essentially no real benefit to yourself. Cause yes, I will still have a job and yes, I will still have employment if bad things did or did not happen to you. But if I can walk you through it, both of us will have a reward from that interaction. And then that moment when you decided to hire me. Yeah, that's a great story. I've never thought about it that way. I like the, the five people you gotta be honest with. That's, that's a great way to put it. Is that something that you've worked on? Like, how do you, I don't want to, I don't want you to give away all your secrets, of course, because I know it's a tough industry, but I think that's a great way to put it. Not everybody does it that way. Was that something you worked on? I, I always say that people in business are kind of like comedians, but we don't tell jokes. We tell stories that are going to lead to positive outcomes and, and problems being solved. So how, how do you came about that great story that you just shared with us? I, I a lot of that just came from personal experience. I, I, I know who and how and when to be totally candid and honest with people. Um, it's something that's extremely hard to do. Uh, I don't know if it's a problem for all men or just some men, but we don't like to give away the goat. We are mm -hmm. taught throughout all of our lives and throughout all of our parents' lives that you know, somebody's looking to, to steal from your village. They're looking to pillage your information to take it and make it their own. And if you live like that, you're missing out on all the good engagements that you're going to get from being honest mm -hmm. with people. And I've thought about it a lot. And those five people or five entities, however you want to refer to it as, are the ones that you must always, without a doubt, be just candid and honest with. Most of them have no judgment judgment because we've seen or heard it all. You can make a mistake and we've been there. We've seen it. We know how to get through it and we're here to help. If you have cancer, granted, you're not going to want to go and tell every person that you meet on the street. I mm -hmm. have cancer. Feel sorry for me. No, you, you want it fixed, but your doctor, the one that you have this close, honest relationship, you trust them to help you get through it. Mm -hmm. Whether that be surgery, chemo, whatever, you trust them to help you get through it. Attorney, the same way through a traumatic event, uh, your, your Lord and Savior, however you wanna view that, also helps you through traumatic events, the loss of a loved one or the birth of a, of a new loved one. Your mama, I mean, come on, everybody loves their mama, right? Mm -hmm. She's the one who gave you life. And then us, we're the ones that'll help walk you through that terrible experience and hopefully be able to pave the way for tomorrow to be brighter and better. Absolutely agree. Thank you for sharing that because that's a great story. Now, what would you say it's a unique selling proposition of Emory? When people do business with you, what would you say are the top two to three reasons they do so? I'd say the first reason is that I'm engaged. I am here to listen to what you have to say. I am going to use everything I have in me to put into this. Uh, 
I will stay up and work nights if I have to. I'll work late if I have to. It's because I care about what you're doing. So I think that is an advantage because a lot of people are transactional. They care only about the dollars going through the account, mm -hmm. not the person and the feelings behind how those dollars even got there. So that was first. The second is I have a pretty good industry knowledge, but I am not egotistical. I know there are people who are more experienced, more knowledgeable out there, and I will bring them in on the team. I will save, I, I am not afraid to go to somebody and go, look, hey, I know you don't want to be involved in this thing or, or you're not going to benefit from it, but you have knowledge that I could use. Mm -hmm. What is it that I can do to bring you into this so that you can share your information with us? If that's giving you commission or if it's allowing you to take the business from me, so be it. But I will have learned something. I will have put the person that I'm helping in the best possible situation to be um, or to, to grow and, and being able to, to uh, swallow your pride or your ego um, is, an, is probably number two. Or I guess that would be three then. So I guess it would be um, engagement, um, the enterprise sort of, I, I bring everybody in to, 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 to help um, based on the knowledge that I have and others and being able to swallow your pride and ask for help uh, when you don't have experience needed to do something. So I have no, no fear. <laughs> yeah. And, and I have a great story that backs that up. And that's absolutely true that you do it that way. Cause I remember one time you came to our house to help us with the house insurance. And I think we spent like two hours because my wife kept asking you a ton of questions. She's an accountant. So she looks into the details and she just asks you questions about everything. You answer every question you made recommendations on some of the switches you had to make. And then in the end, I remember that your recommendation was to stay with that, the, the broker in the agency we had because the switch wouldn't make sense. We would probably get a better deal with them. I don't remember because of the longevity or something. And I was amazed because like, of course I was grateful as a client, but I also run a service business. So on the other side, I was like, hey, and we just spend probably two hours plus maybe a little bit driving here and there. This was a while ago, pre-COVID. And, and in my head, I was like, because I remember asking you, like, do you do these consultations? Do you charge for them? And you was like, no, this is just part of my job to, to be helpful and answer questions. So I can uh, vouch that, that it's absolutely true. Now, Mary, let's think a little bit about, of all the people out there, there's different business sizes, there's different professionals and people out there, who is it that you can help the most? When you look at the people that you've helped throughout your career and now in this position that you're in, who is it that you can help the most and how do you help them? I believe the, the people I help the most are business owners. I, I think that business owners get a little um, overwhelmed with the, all the duties that they have to perform. And me being both a previous small business owner myself before I went to the corporate environment and to the ebbs and flows of being a business owner allows you to understand what their challenges are. And, and it gets you more of that symbiotic relationship where I will share with you my challenges, you'll share with me yours, and then we can explore how we can resolve all of them together. So. I guess small business owners are my, my cream, uh, what do they call that? Uh, whatever that specialty that you want to say, your, your cream sauce or whatever, um, that allows me to just be able to engage with people who are doing great things um, that are just starting out or you know, just trying to get to the next level or even if they're just trying to feed their family and provide a, uh, a stable environment for their kids to grow up and so they can spend the time at home and time at work uh, to balance out that life. So I think that that would probably be best. Any, any small business owner. Any particular size of business or any particular industry in which you think you can create more value? The two industries I've specialized in recently are construction and real estate. Mm -hmm. I've been doing both of those for almost a decade now, but this new role has allowed me to be able to dive deeper into the functions of the business. And that allows me to catch more errors than I would have in the past. 
and then that means I can deal with larger businesses. Um, you know, right now, anything up to about 30 million in revenue is a business that I can work with and uh, really digest and, and provide good, valuable insight and hopefully insurance solutions for. But I can definitely um, speak to pain points or identify challenges where they could improve their situation, like we did with Irina, or mm -hmm. we can um, identify challenges that they might see in the near future and be prepared for. Correct, correct. Emery, anything else that you would like to share with the audience thinking about somebody out there, a professional that wants to be a thought leader in the industry and dominate their niche to help others grow? Anything else that you would like to share? Any resources, any quotes, any last thoughts? There's a fantastic, uh, I guess, presence on LinkedIn called Latin Presarios that I listen to and watch <laughs> all the time. I never miss an episode. These guys uh, always help me get insight into what I'm doing, how to improve what I'm doing. And uh, him and Gary Venichek too, he also uh, gets you to remember why you're doing something and be mm -hmm. deliberate with your time. There's a reason why you chose the industry that you're in. Explore that reasoning and maximize your why. Why am I doing this? Why do I do that? If you can figure that out, it'll provide a huge amount of, of, of comfort and, and you know, deliberate motion going forward, which will allow you to be more successful, have a better work-life balance, uh, maybe even achieve all the goals that you dreamed of as a kid, or maybe dream up new ones because you're so successful that you've surpassed every goal that you had originally set. Mm -hmm. There's just, you know, there's so many different ways to review stuff. And I'm really honest when I watch all your your shows and stuff on on the on, on the LinkedIn network because it's really gives you good information and if you take the time to take notes you're going to walk away with so much value thank you for the kind words Emery we did that was not a sponsored comment we did not pay for that thank you very much well thank you Emery I want to be mindful of your time thank you for being on the podcast we enjoyed having you I'm sure there's much more that we can talk about maybe we would have to do a round two but for now I think we have good information to share with the audience and thanks again for being on the podcast it's my pleasure I enjoyed it very much